conversation on the issues of the day. Your host this evening, senior newsman Gary Moreno. Good evening and thank you for joining us for this week's edition of Let's Talk. Joining us on the set tonight are, of course, Martha Dismond, who is the executive director of the Family Center, mm -hmm. Dr. Sandy De Silva, who is the director of services at the Family Center, yes, is it? Yes. And Mr. Darian Douglas. Yes. Didn't know how big this guy was until I saw him today, <laughs> who is a family support specialist. And tonight we're going to be talking about parenting in the 21st century, what are Bermuda's challenges and successes. Of course, this is all part of the Family Center's social media and education campaign titled Change Starts With Me. And this campaign includes print media, it goes the whole nine yards, and the goal of the campaign is to raise awareness of the many things which can be done to make a difference in the life of a child, and of course to highlight some of the changes that we must begin to make in individually and systematically in order to have better outcomes, of course, again, for our children. It's always about the children as you saw tonight. Um, Martha, I'm going to start with you. What does this change start with me? What is it all about and where did this idea come from? Well, um, thank you for having us this evening and it's a very important topic, uh, we think, in light of some of the situations we have even as recent as last week. So we're very grateful to be here and to have a chance to talk about this. The campaign itself started with uh, every year we actually have an education and awareness campaign just so we can find a way to get out there a little bit more and talk to parents about positive parenting and, and thinking about children. We know that the situations we're seeing today are situations that have been there for a long time. Um, it's all about how we raise our children, interact with our children, interact with each other as well. And uh, therefore, we have wanted to have a campaign that uh, begins to speak to the public about the things that you can do in a child's life to make, to make a difference. And uh, the Family F uh, Center has a what's called a Family Forum Group. And this is just grassroots Bermudians that meet with us once a month where we talk about uh, problem-solving issues that we see in the community. Recently, they all committed to conscientiously looking at how change can start with them first that if I want to see more forgiveness in the community, more <coughs> compassion, let me look at my own life and see if I'm being compassionate or, or forgiving. And we decided to adopt that uh, as our campaign slogan, Change Starts With Me. Be the change that starts the change. Let us all look inside and see what we can do uh, to make a change with ourselves and particularly parents in order to really see the change in your own child. You're talking about 21st century parenting. Some people say what we need is a good dose of old school parenting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that in fact the case? That's certainly not what we've been teaching. <laughs> I'm just asking. <laughs> and I'm going to uh, just, just tell you that, uh, and I, I know Dr. De Silva will tell you more about this, um, but we've seen in working with parents that the greatest benefit to um, the, the interaction that comes with a child and a parent is positive interaction <coughs> and positive relationship. And I'm a parent, I have a daughter, and I'm learning every day how to be in her life in a positive way. And we also know that those who are acting out the most have probably had the old school parenting for years. And, uh, you know, it's awfully painful. After a while, you become numb to that. And then there, of course, are people in the community who say, well, my parents gave me a good Every so often. Every so often, and I seem to be okay. <laughs> but I do believe that ultimately you learn by that kind of parenting that that is the way to uh, make change in a child's life. And we just as Family Center don't believe that ultimately it really is the thing that makes the difference. Dr. De Silva, what are some of the challenges that you would say families are facing today? I know that we're in, still in an economic downturn. Mm -hmm. Things, it always seems to be centered around the, the economic situation, economic circumstances. In a, in a, in a, that uh, families are facing right now. We had a statement in the House of Assembly or answers to questions in the House of Assembly on Friday where Minister Wayne Scott indicated that there is an increased demand for social assistance here in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. So what are the challenges that families are facing today and what, what can you say to people to give them hope? Because I think that's what people are really looking for. Absolutely. 
in one sense, you know, um, the, chase, the challenges that we <coughs> face today as parents are very much the same as our foremothers and forefathers um, had experienced in that when we have children, they're not born with an instruction manual. They are individuals with their own unique strengths and needs. And so parenting has always required much patience, time, and energy. And then when you um, throw that, and love, and, and many doses of love, when you throw that into today's situation with unemployment, with many families in Bermuda living, living at the poverty line, with unaddressed trauma being passed on from generations to generations, with lack of education, our sons and daughters leaving high school without graduation diplomas, then it does make parenting today more complicated, more complex. Then we throw technology in there as well. Um, it's making the world a smaller place in that our work demands are now beeping at us from our telephones. You know, our children are on websites learning about things that we may not always be able, being able to monitor. So in that sense, just recognizing the challenges that are out there is the first step, because we need to just be real and honest about what obstacles that we're facing so that we can turn those obstacles into opportunities. And that's where the hope comes in, um, because there's this big word, resilience, that we all have the capacity for, we all have the potential for. So there's no family out there that should be sitting in a helpless, hopeless state. You need to know where to find the help, ask for the help, take stock of what's gone on for you, look deep inside, where are your scars, where are your wounds, how has that been passed on, and how can you get help for addressing those? Because resilience is there, we need to find it, hone in on it, bring people's strengths out, and then give them what they need to carry on their lives in a successful way. So is it that we've gone away with the concept of it, it takes a village to raise a child mm. because everybody is mm -hmm. now in their own uh, silo, as they say? Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? It does still take a village, absolutely, um, to, to raise a child in but that. But have we moved away from that concept? Um, I think in Bermuda, we're in a neat, unique situation. In one sense, we can say yes, because parents are working longer hours and there are more working demands. But in another sense, we also still are a country where we have many families living in homesteads. And so your family is not that far away, or our neighbors are not that far away. I think it's about a choice that we make to either keep our secrets behind closed doors or whether we actually do reach out and ask for the help from the village that's actually right at our doorstep because we are a unique, you know, unique place in that we're small. So people are, are right there. How do we access that help and not feel shame about it? But just as, as I mentioned, we have the minister saying that people are in need of financial assistance and surely if they're in need of financial assistance, they're in need of other kinds of assistance as well. Is the family center seeing an increase in demand for services that you would perhaps provide, D D Darian, or you, Dr. De Silva? What do you see? Mm -hmm. I think there's uh, definitely an increase um, in helping people with coaching their children at home and, and getting tools that they need to support their children in a way where they won't yell or do different things in a way to help their children to become um, better, you know, children. And I think there has been an increase because we have been going in a lot more homes lately. Yeah. But when did this all come about that we needed to have people to coach us to be parents? Yes. Mm. <laughs> Well, I think it goes back to your village comment. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, long ago that maybe we were, we were passing on and role modeling parent, parenting to each other. I think today with the many demands that are upon us and also when you've got unemployment staring at you in the face, when you have bills piling up, then the last thing that you may have patience for is parenting. Um, and certainly at Family Center, what we saw was a rise in 2010 after mm -hmm. the surge of gun violence. Um, that we had many more calls for help. And what we also saw was that families were asking us for help in really high risk situations. So we are going into homes where there were shootings just yesterday right around the corner or right there. Um, and so families are calling us for help because they are in more dangerous situations and they are at their bottom. And so they are finally reaching out and calling us. What are you making excuses for people's bad behavior? Well, we need to think about where the bad behavior is coming from. Mm. Um, there, are, there are causes to a lot of this. Um, you know, we see the, the um, uh, acting out behavior, usually like 20 years later, from something mm -hmm. that's, been, that's happened mm -hmm. earlier. So it could be seen as an excuse, because if we don't really look at the, 
the causes of, of you know, someone that, as, as uh, Dr. De Silva mentioned, unaddressed trauma. Uh, you, we know of, of individuals who have been abused 15, 20 years ago, never spoke about it. But when the going gets tough, if mm -hmm. you lose your job, uh, you go through a divorce, you know, those conditions that bring out the triggers in, inside of you, uh, we're going to see the acting out behavior. And so when we talk about excuses, um, it's, it's not so easy to say to an individual who was abused at five years old that you need to pull up your socks and get with it and be in a better relationship with your son mm. if that abuse was never treated. Yes. And if you talk to the inmates up at Westgate and a lot of young disenfranchised today, they will tell you stories that have not, you know, issues that have not been addressed. So I, we never call them excuses. Wow. Yeah. We yeah. call them causes that have never been addressed. Mm -hmm. And once you get to those causes and people begin to go inside and see what those scars and wounds are and they are treated, all of a sudden they're a different person and they begin to take more responsibility not only for their actions but in being a better parent with their child. So Darian, what does this, this, this parenting in the 21st century look like? I mean, how hard is it to be a parent today? Hmm. I mean, speaking from my own experience, <laughs> I follow the pattern that I saw with my parents. Right. And thank God, it seems to be working <laughs> so far. Yeah, I think it's really hard. I, I think, um, like um, <coughs> Dr. De Silva said, there's no handbook in being a parent. I mean, back in the days, you used to have what you call traditional um, families, which was mother and, and father. But now we have um, single parent households. We have blended family households. We have um, unique alternative um, family households with grandparents raising children. You have aunts and uncles raising children. So th the complexity of it is totally different. And I want to say it's really, really hard. I mean. Um, you have to really be present and you have to be there in order to be a parent. It's, it's like what you put in is what you get out. And I think at the Family Center, that's what we're trying to encourage parents to do. Um, you can't just have your child and don't do anything and expect your child to become great. But, it's, but what you put into your child is very, very important so you can get something out of it. And that's what we try to encourage parents to do. So what is your job really? Because uh, a family support specialist, this is the very first time I've heard of that tech. <laughs> Well, um, I do a little bit of everything, I want to say. Uh, first and foremost is building a rapport and a relationship with the family. I mean, you have to be able to trust someone in order to help someone, and they have to be able to trust you. And I think on top of that, it's, it's about um, helping, because a lot of parents have the tools. Some of them have the tools that they just don't know how to implement it. So some parents may yell, and they say, well, Mr. Douglas, I don't want to yell anymore. What can I do other than yelling? Or some parents come and say, I don't want to use physical force or, or use hitting anymore. What else can I do? So my job is kind of helping parents to say, do you know what, there's an, uh, another alternative way. And it's about how do you talk to your children, do you, you know, your tone of voice, your body language. Because if, you're, if your body language is like this, the likelihood of your children to come back to tell you something else is going to be difficult. So it's just like coaching them and, and helping them to recognize that they play an intricate part on how um, they, to raise their children. And of course, I have to go here. How much of this plays a role in some of what we saw last week? some of what we continue mm -hmm. to hear about. Mm -hmm. How much of a role does that play in, in, in this current situation, this gang situation, call it what it is? I mean, there's, this plays a, a huge role mm -hmm. because um, our parenting is what helps to create our self-image, our sense of self-worth, who we are, our identity, you know, as we get older. And so a lot of what's happening is young men trying to find an identity in a world that has taken many opportunities also away from them. So our community has also played a role in what we're seeing play out. And the parenting is what you're going to do to help to either, you know, inoculate your child from that or not. And so what we're seeing is young men trying to find their place, trying to create an identity for themselves and trying to make a way of life. And if this has been feel if this has been the way to go then they're going to latch on to that until we give them something else that they can feel successful at and you know one of the things that I think helps us at Family Center to, to be quite successful with the families that we work with is that we always have hope for everybody that walks through the door and we don't believe that anybody intentionally wants to cause harm to others or that they want to um, make a mess of their own lives. You know, they want, they also want what, what's best for them, but how do you teach them alternative ways of feeling success, of feeling good about themselves? But it can be argued that Bermuda provides countless opportunities for its young people to excel. Why aren't they making use of those opportunities? 
the and football clubs have various programs that they put on that try to steer people away from yeah. antisocial behavior. And so then it often comes down to, again, this parenting piece. So if you've been, if you've had traumas when you were little, and as you get older, then you may not see that as an opportunity that's there for you, or you may not feel safe there, or you may not know how to relate to somebody. So if you've been raised by um, caregivers who haven't been able to show you what it really means to be safe, to be loved unconditionally, and to know what it, you know, know what it takes to actually also stick with an opportunity that's given to you as well, then you're not gonna know how to do that as an adult. If we didn't give that to you when you were little, so we need to teach that to you now. Because you're right, there are many opportunities. That's what, that's what should give families hope, is there, that there are lots of opportunities on this very small island. But we need to teach people sometimes those very basic skills of how to take those opportunities and use them. But Darian, this thing seems to be affecting mostly the young males. Mm -hmm. We know that there are young women involved, but and particularly the young black male right. are the ones we've seen directly affected. As a young black male yourself, what is your experience with these young men? What do you hear from them? Well, I think <coughs> opportunities is, is, is one thing. Um, there's not a lot of um, jobs out there for them. Um, there's so many factors, um, but I think it also starts with, like Sandy was saying, um, if you don't have the right role models, I'm um, teaching you right from wrong, or you don't, you can't comprehend. If I do this, this is what's going to happen. Then you're going to find yourself in these situations because then you're thinking on emotions rather than thinking with your brain. You're just saying, okay, this person disrespect me. I'm gonna go out there and do this. But if you you stop to think and you have a good role model, you say, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't do that because this is what's going to happen. I don't think they put that in in the forefront. If I do this, this is what's going to happen. Or they act off the emotion. So I think if there was more opportunities, um, much more things that they can do to, to feel successful, I think that you know maybe you know they won't go these, this route. And education is very, another important thing. If you have a lot of um, young men graduating out of high school still can't read and write, that also plays into a factor of it. So there's so many different. Let me be um, devil's advocate. Whose fault is that? If you go to school and didn't learn to read and write, whose fault is that? Well, you know, I think one I'm of the being devil's advocate. No, no, being no. devil's advocate because <laughs> I, I, th I think the piece that we're missing uh, is that it's one thing to, to live in a normal mm -hmm. household mm -hmm. and where your parents wake you up in the mm -hmm. morning, ensure that you get your breakfast, ensure that you're dressed, ensure that you've done your homework the night before, all those things that are normal, and then send you off to school. And, and, and when they send you off to school, remind you every day how important it is to get your education. Those are the so-called normal things in a normal household. But if you are a child whose parents do not feed you in the morning, because maybe they can't afford to feed you, um, do not remind you of the importance of education and don't think it's that important because they haven't been taught that it's important, who um, you know, basically um, struggle to make sure their children have the proper clothing and, and all of that sort, then it is not a routine for you to go to school and become educated and take advantage of the opportunities. And so we see this often, that it is not a normal routine mm -hmm. for many of these. And you can, again, you can go up to Westgate and ask them their stories. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you hear them, you mm -hmm. go, hmm, that makes sense. Because they did not have those things. So whose fault is it? Conditions, these conditions, you know, trauma that occurs if, 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 if a, a parents decide to get divorced, mm. It is not the child's Child fault, and now. frankly, it's not the parent's fault. Yeah. Something didn't work out, but how do you protect the children in that situation? It is an effort to do that. Are we and doing, are we doing enough to protect our children? Well, I think it's an we awareness from a, yeah. From, yeah. A community, from a community standpoint. No. Mm. Absolutely. No. I, I no. say no. Mm -hmm. I say no. Because I don't think we are as aware. I think people live their daily lives, and mm -hmm. they forget that children must be trained up. That it isn't simply, you know, I, I have a child, okay, I go to work and I put some food on the table. You know, we have, if we have certain core beliefs that we believe, you've got to be saying, um, telling children those beliefs every day to remind them to be courteous and kind and compassionate and education is important. In jurisdictions and countries where there is a real work ethic and, and strong educational um, foundations, these parents talk about this all the time and children will tell you that. Mm -hmm. But if for some reason in Bermuda, 
there are some families to, that do and many families that don't. And it's, it's just not being aware of how important these things are, particularly in an environment where we have so many complicated uh, situations that, that make it difficult to raise children in the 21st oh, oh, century. Yeah. Cable and all sorts yeah. of things that mm -hmm. make it very complicated. Mm -hmm. Now, yesterday I was talking to a, a former social worker and the individual was saying to me that he is aware and has seen situations where these gangs are recruiting boys as young as 10 years of age. Sure. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that in Bermuda? We, well, <laughs> we don't, we're not in on the insides of yeah. recruitment, <laughs> but we can certainly um, um, suggest that that's probably going on. I mean, I think we've probably had uh, talked to individuals who said when they started they were early, it was early age. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so why is that? They're desperate. And so that speaks to another point that if you're having to go to that age, mm -hmm. there's some great programs that are going yeah. on that are working with middle school <laughs> kids to say, you want this path or this path? Let me show you the opportunities on this good path and let me stick with you on that path. And, and, and having to go younger is, is, is telling you the, 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 uh, the urgency of the problem in that uh, individuals are desperate to, to maintain that gang mm -hmm. environment because it is a sense of belonging for yeah. many of them. Mm -hmm. If we can replace that with a positive sense of belonging, we have it licked and we won't have to worry about 10 year olds. Are our politicians getting the message? You're asking a political question. <laughs> no, 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 no political question. I'm asking a straight up question because they are the ones who have the, the authority to make the legislation and put things in place to start effecting the change that we need to have in the community. Well, I want to suggest to you <laughs> that it's, it's no longer up to the politicians. Mm. Mm. It is yeah. up to us because if there are 400 or 500 or, or less young men and women out there who are involved so in So then gangs, why, are we, why are we not getting the message as a community? Where is that message being one? lost? Because mm. change starts That's with us. us. Yeah. Where do, what do we need, what do I need to do? When my, my uh, family forum group decided that, that uh, we're gonna take up this commitment to look within ourselves, I said, let me try this for a month. It was yeah. darn hard, trying it on myself. So it's mm -hmm. very difficult for us to make a change. Mm -hmm. Even, I, let, let's just be honest here, even the concept of, you know, uh, uh, the devil's advocate of a good <coughs> whooping. Mm -hmm. You know, can we, can we encourage people to be a little bit more receptive to restorative healing efforts and being but that's going to take a whole culture change isn't it now you're talking yes. now I'm here because this is about a culture change mm -hmm. it's a and it's a culture change that's needed because we have 20 to 25 years of situations that have never been addressed individuals 20 to 25 years absolutely you're about three generations mm -hmm. yes we mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. we're talking about you know you know Bermudians and and our culture here people do not like to talk about the problems we keep them hidden under the covers because we need to look as if everyone's mm -hmm. doing well. There are many people that have not been doing so well. Mm -hmm. And as someone has said, when the tide goes out, you can see who's been swimming naked. We've been swimming naked with the number of young people who have not been educated well, mm -hmm. with the, the long list of traumatic issues that have been unaddressed. I can tell you since 2009, with regard to the number of um, young people that have been murdered, in terms of those families getting counseling for the trauma that has been, um, you know, they've experienced, very few of those families have gone to get counseling or getting those issues addressed. They've very not, few. They have not gotten counseling or. And they've not got it because so, it's not available, or they choose not to get it. I think they they choose not to get it, and it's because of a culture. Mm -hmm. And then, of mm -hmm. course, some of them, I'm sure, mm -hmm. are afraid yeah. of coming out in the public yes. and being yeah. seen. Yeah. But, but that is a problem for us as a community. And I know Dr. De Silva can talk a little mm -hmm. bit about how difficult it is for families to come out and get the help. Yeah. But why so if that help is needed? You know, I mean, change is a process. None of us like change very much, right? I mean, as, as a parent myself, in terms of you know, changing the way that you do something, changing your routine to go to work. Can you imagine if tomorrow I told you, completely do everything opposite, or tonight go to bed on the opposite side of how you went to sleep? You know, it's about doing things a completely different way to how you were raised, how you watched um, parenting happen in your own household. And so it's about overcoming the fear of what change may look like, about having the hope that you have the strength and the courage to do it and the skills to be able to do it, and overcoming shame. 
another part of our culture is a lot about shame. As a parent, how many times have I been in the grocery store and my three-year-old may, or now four-year-old, may do something and I go, what's the cashier going to say? And that's just, she's grabbing a chocolate bar They know I'm going to have to tell her not to pick up. And so there's a shaming piece as well that we just need to just take off you know, take off the, um, wipe, wipe clean, if you will, off the board. Yes. Stop making people feel ashamed of their parenting or how they were parented so that we can just feel a bit more open and easy about asking for the help. But it's not easy. How receptive do you think people have been based on what the Family Center has done, and particularly with this uh, Change Starts With Me initiative? Um, how receptive have people been to this change? Well, certainly uh, we started with our group and they've been very receptive and um, we've been kind of watching the airways to see if, if we, we hear of, of how people are receiving it and, and it's, it's, from what I can see it's been fairly positive but it's, it's almost like making New Year's resolutions, you know, yeah. you, know you, you, you got to do it. Yeah, and I'll check you, you know, in a year to see how well you did with that. <laughs> but, you know, in this community uh, we have to do this. As, as Dr. Silva said, we have to do it because it really is a culture change. And it's, it's coming out of the box of the way we've done things and, and knowing that we can do them very differently. We're a bit of a punitive culture. You know, we do put blast things on the front page when someone's done something pretty horrific. I've noticed in the last six months or so we've been trying to put some positive things there which is great because people need to be built up and feel like, you know, people actually care about you. They care about the good things that you're doing. And there really is a lot of good going on in this community. If we would talk about it more, we may have more families that go out and seek it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, as Dr. De Silva said, this change is not easy, but it, but it must take place. And we are getting some, some good response, but it's, it's not easy to do. Yeah. So I want to come back again to this whole situation with, you mentioned single parent homes and so on. There are many people who will tell you, I came from a single parent home and I don't have the issues that these individuals have now. That's a cop out. Is it really though? I think like um, uh, Ms. Dittmar <coughs> said, it depends on every situation is different. different. And every walk is different. Everybody's story is different. Just because one um, single mother made it out good, another single mother may have um, tr generational trauma or been through a lot. So every family is different. but. And how you deal with it, we got to handle each family with care and love and, and give, provide hope for each family. What is this generational trauma? I've heard, it, heard the term before. What exactly is it? Mm. So it's, you're right, this multi-generational trauma is like this buzzword that we've been using over the last few years. And really it's simply unresolved trauma that gets passed from one generation to the next. And so if I was physically abused and I learned that um, violence is a way to show authority and power in my home, then, then I may act out in that way. And so that's the unresolved trauma that then gets passed on to the next generation. And so that is hard to tackle, as, as Mrs. Dismont said. We, if you've got 25 years, this has three generations. It's actually not a lot. That's a, a child, a parent, and a grandparent. Yes. And so how do you, though, get each of those people to tell their stories so that healing could happen from one generation to the next because you can't just expect the change to happen with the child and sometimes families will do that they will say come and fix my child please but once they realize that we will hold their information with the utmost confidentiality that we can be trusted that we're human as well and we really do care about you then what you find is that people will start to share their secrets sounds, their their wounds their scars sounds to me from listening to you guys that people are hooting in this country. Oh, mm. I was just thinking about yeah. this as Sandy was speaking. There are a lot of people hurting. Yes. And I think it's a bit about a pervasive culture of, of really not listening. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a very odd thing, really, in this community where you have so many caring. But I just believe that we've had a culture here of, let me just say it quite honestly, not enough leaders that demonstrate the care for the little people, if I can say that, and if you understand what I mean by that, which is um, <laughs> that we're not all going to be, you know, the, the, the leaders of the country, but in our own right, each and every one of us, we should be valued as an important individual. And I, you know, I, as you well know, I sat on the um, SAGE Commission. SAGE Commission, yes. And um, when I had an opportunity to go inside and look at uh, how government was functioning, I was so um, taken 
by the strength of the frontline people and the wisdom intelligence that that was there i just f felt very sad however that all of that wisdom and intelligence and passion for their jobs was not acknowledged enough by their superiors quite honestly and i'll say it and be happy to say it in, in any space that it was going to waste and and so that kind of um, certain ones are important and the others aren't so important i found that with a lot of individuals feeling that they weren't as valued, their opinions weren't valued yes. as, as, as the others. And I think that's it's a bit of a pervasive culture for whatever reason. All right, and, and, let's uh, hold that thought there because Trevor Lindsay is giving me the evil eye telling me that mm -hmm. we need to go to break. But when we come back, I want to talk about the parenting trends today and how they're affecting our, our current social problems, such as the gang involvement and such. Sure. Stay with us. And thanks for staying with us. Joining us on this set now is Miss Marilyn Outerbridge. And uh, she, of course, is a grandmother raising her grandchild. We're going to come to Marilyn in a bit. But just before we went to break, I was asking how are parenting trends today affecting the current social problems such as gang violence or gang involvement, sorry, and unemployment? Mm -hmm. So in addition to the unaddressed traumas that we talked about, what we hear and see, and as a parent myself, is this challenge of how do I establish authority in my household? And how do I balance that with also sh showing nurture, love, and balance it with all of the demands that I have being thrown at me? So again, we, you know, we talk about our cell phones that are beeping at us with that work email that we just need to check at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. But yet we need to, we're also told to give quality time to your family, to your children. So what we hear and what we see are that parents struggle with how do I establish authority? You know, how do I also have healthy power in my family so that my children are not feeling like I'm being too punitive, but I'm also not then being indifferent and letting my children raise themselves because I have too many other worries and pressures to think about. I mean, with the economy downturn, imagine how many of us go to bed at night thinking about all of the bills that have not been paid the food that's not in the fridge to be able to provide for breakfast or lunch. There's no way that you can be a patient, kind, loving parent with all of that in the forefront of your thinking. And there are many parents that are absolutely doing their best to try to do that. And I'm just, we're just acknowledging that that is extremely difficult. How many parents are succeeding at doing all of that though? I think if you reach out for help and you realize that you're not alone, we all have scars, we all have wounds, we all have a story to tell, and therefore there's no shame in telling your story. If you reach out for help and you start, that change starts with me, it really does happen. Because not only do we, we get lots of calls for help, but we also have lots of families leaving our services doing really well and sustaining that because we also stalk you a little, we check up on you and we call you, you know, after um, a period of time to say, how are you doing? And there are a lot of families that say, you know, things are not perfect, but I go back to all the things that you taught me to do, you know, that toolkit that I needed to have because again, children aren't born with an instruction manual. So if you reach out for help, you're real about your secrets, you talk honest, you talk straight with each other, then change can actually happen. So how do we go about doing away with the stigma that's preventing people from seeking the help that they need. How do we go about saying, look, this is not taboo, you're not the only person, there are lots of other people, but they're getting help and there is help available for you. Well, we've always uh, instituted <coughs> sort of a, uh, a very confidential space and, and communicated to parents that when you come into our space, we maintain the confidentiality of your issues. Um, and, and so in Bermuda, it's important that, that families feel that they can go into a space and, and be safe and, and divulge what has been their challenges over the years and then come out on the other side having uh, gone through a, a situation to, to correct some of those things. And so the confidentiality <coughs> is really important, but it also takes a little bit of courage and to step out and, 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 and do the work, which is what we often find in a lot of our groups with parents. And I talk to them about the courage and we have a parent here this evening that could tell you a little <laughs> bit about what it took for her to step out and say, you know, there's changes that must be made, and I'm going to do my best to, to, to step out and be courageous. Tell us about your experience, Ms. Alterbridge. What is it that, that helped you to share, share a little bit about your story with us and, and how you got to the family center and the changes and so on that you've made to get where you are today? Change really did start with me. And um, I think 
I had to humble myself. I had to take a good look at who I am. Parenting does not come with a book of rules. And so my book is the Bible. Holy and surly, I depend on it, left, right, and center. Um, but in my study of that, I had to look at myself and I had to make some changes with myself because it spoke to me. And when we always say we are the village, yes, we are the village, but why we have this great big village and all of these problems are going on? So I looked at myself and I started to mend the problems that I had with me. I had to look at the problems that I had with me. I had to make amends, I had to make changes in my life, my lifestyle. And in making those changes, my children were able to see that. And they were able to appreciate that. And that just kept me going. I had to keep making those changes. I had to correct the bad behaviors and implement good behaviors. I was Children learn what they see. That's they right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and believe me, they do learn what they see. And so if parents could be the best role models for their children, parents could, could lead, be, play the leading role. I love being a parent. And I'm not going to let my children take that away from me. But I find that that's what happens. Parents lose their parenthood, their parenting skills they, to their children. You can't lose your parenting skills to your children. I am the parent. I'm the mother. And I teach my children to respect me as that. I'm able to humble myself to listen to them, listen to their cries, listen to what they had to say, and not be judgmental. Family service for me was for my, it was for my grandson. But I got the most important lesson of my life by bringing myself to go to the family center with my grandson. It was for him because he had lost his father in one of the shootings. And I said, I can't, <laughs> look, I can't even deal with this, sir. I don't want to go to no family center. Um, but it wasn't for me. It was for him. And so something just said to me, look, it's being offered. I knew I couldn't pay for it, but it's being offered. Take this young man. And so I took him. Boy, I could tell you today, Gary, I have no regrets. It was the best thing that could have happened for him and for me. And if, this is, if, if it could be available for others, for others, because I, 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 everything that you all said tonight, I could attest to it. <clears throat> I feel the pain of the people of our children. They are going through hell, and they don't have a way out. And unless we, the village, create a way out for our children, then we could expect just more trauma, more hurt, more pain. It's imperative that we, as parents, find the solutions for our children for what they are going through. Of course, feel free to join the discussion by calling us at 295-2828 and uh, make your contribution, ask a question, or give a suggestion as the case might be. How do we go about solving this problem? Is there any one solution to this? Is it going to take a multitude of approaches? Is it going to take months? Eons, how long is it going to take before we begin to even scratch the surface of how we go about dealing with this problem? Well, I, I think, like anything, um, we really know what the problem is. It's the will and the courage to do what's necessary. When we know of an approaching hurricane, <coughs> we know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And we think about what we have to do. And one of the first things we do is work together. We don't think twice about it. We work together. Mm -hmm. And uh, consequently, it's about pulling together. I recently sent something to one of the ministers <coughs> to say with this current um, array of shootings, it is urging us all 
to take all of our efforts and resources and pour them into the 400, 500, however many young men there are out there, all of our resources in one space. That's what we do when a hurricane is approaching. From the stores to the businesses to the people, we know what it takes to get, you know, to protect ourselves and we, we make sure that we're all focused on one thing, protection and care and, and, and aftercare. And it's the same thing. So, you know, it's, it's unprecedented for this community, for every single one, except when a hurricane is approaching, for us all to come together in one way. But I think this is what this is going to take. So we need to, have that to hurricane, arms. need to have that hurricane mentality 365 days We do, here. and we absolutely <laughs> have hurricanes of uh, enormous proportions hitting us right now. And imagine what it would be like for these young men to see the entire community to come together and say, we care, mm -hmm. we're putting together resources mm -hmm. for you, um, and, and we all bond together to make it happen. It would be unprecedented, but I think it's totally possible. Good evening, Cola. Go ahead, you're on there. Yes, uh, good evening, Mr. Moreno. Can you turn your television down, please, sir? Sure, no problem. I would just like to make a simple comment and congratulate your panel that you have on tonight because they have hit the nail right on the head. And we had discussions and talks for many, many moons at amnesties and all types of stuff. But the actual love you can actually feel from your panel tonight is, is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And the things that they are talking about is hitting the nail right on the head. As well as Miss Butterfield, you know, it's so great to her people to give hope to our youth, you know, that there is hope. And I want to give strength to the panel because they're on the front line trying to help so many people in our country, you know, and they need strength as well. Mm -hmm. And they need to be told that they are loved mm -hmm. and their job, what they do is very, very much appreciated, you know, and I just sat here tonight listening, and I just hung in there, you know, because I've heard these things over and over before, and, and nothing changes. But with this positive vibe, I hope that the whole community, the whole village, comes together and push forward on some of these things that they're talked about tonight. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So there you go, people, uh, well, this goodly gentleman expressing his support for the initiative. Good evening, caller. Go ahead, you're on there. Thank you. Gary? Yes, sir. This is Graham, one of your musician friends. How are you, sir? I'm good, thanks. How are you this evening? I'm all right. Excellent subject. Mr. Trombone. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to say that uh, in terms of, and I've said this twice now in two nights, I was uh, at a meeting last night and talked about, we talked about the disconnect. Um, they had a meeting at some segregated club. They talked about a disconnect and trying to find solutions or ways of trying to rectify the, the problem is that we have so many people who, have, who have, don't feel connected to their community, right? Yes. And I stood up and I suggested that maybe the audience consider the impact of not just the sporting clubs, but also the impact of music in bringing people together and fostering connections mm -hmm. with the wider community. Music has a very important role to play. And I would encourage everyone who thinks that there's no solution, there is a solution. If you look at some of the examples of music bringing people together, you can go down to Trinidad, you can see all the music with Carnival, people f from every walk of life together. If you wanted to look for another example, you had Bob Marley bringing together Siaga and Manley years ago when it was a very bitter election campaign in Jamaica. Only Marley could have brought them up and stayed together, and that's the power of music. I hope we can see some of the benefits to supporting music and the arts in Bermuda. Thank you kindly, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, lost my train of thought once he mentioned Trinidad. Everything went here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you were talking about getting people to come and get involved in this thing. How can people become involved? How can people reach out to the center, or even if they want to contribute in some way by way of expertise or otherwise to help deal with this situation? Well, uh, you know, we, we certainly haven't uh, brainstormed. It's up for, to the community to really brainstorm how do we come together the way we've come together in other situations. And 
uh, at some point, uh, maybe we'll, we'll bring as many people in the room as possible and brainstorm how do we come together? And that includes... Because this is a national crisis. Mm -hmm. Of course it is, and it's been a national crisis for a while. Yes, mm -hmm. And absolutely. why have we not addressed this? Why not? Problem? Why have we not addressed it? Because people, are, for whatever reason, they get into their spaces and they feel that they can't talk to their brother or sister. When, right after the uh, Hurricane Gonzalo, I just observed all over the island, where everybody was in their homes, and then when the hurricane ended, everybody walked outside of their homes and looked around and talked to other people. And of course, y you know, do you know your neighbor? You're, you're just learning your mm -hmm. neighbor. So the, the point right now is connection, even mm -hmm. as he mentioned it, through music, whatever way we need to. We need to come together in the interest of these young people and others. I'm being told to go to commercial. Is it a sponsored break? If it's not, I'm not going to commercial. Go ahead, caller. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, good evening. How are you? Okay, sir. Yes, bless you, Gary. Same to you, sir. To your panel, especially to Mama, Mama Otter Bridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that basically uh, we don't take enough time to step back. People say never dwell in the past. But we don't have to dwell. But we have to reflect to see what worked in the past and reintroduce it for the future. When I was a young boy in the 50s growing up in Bermuda, every child had gotten a little bit of trouble. The police officer didn't try to run him up into the police station and try to make a big spectacle of the boy. I say that to say this. Children go to school from nursery. I'm sure at nursery when I was going to school, uh, the teachers were looking at how good you can color, stay inside the line, when you went to primary school, you went to craft class, they watched how good you can do your craft. The point that I'm trying to actually make is that your gift was being sort, sorted out. Uh, today, these children, are good. they're not even getting a gift. A gentleman just early, he mentioned about music. That's great. Music plays a big part in the diet, and I'm pretty sure that most of your members of your panel, and possibly even yourself, out Gary, I heard you guys say uh, your saxophone and friends. So, yes, your, in, your instrumental in music, so part of your balance in your spirit is being balanced out. And even when I was going to school, we had a music class, but most times there wasn't a music teacher because it was a public school and we really couldn't afford one. Uh, gymnastics. You see, our balance as a people <clears throat> is basically crafted around certain elements that's natural. Okay, so I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up, please. I'm going, to, I'm going to wrap it up. If these things are not sorted out and addressed, well, then it's easy for other people to put their hand in there and take control over your children. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, sir. Uh, no, the train of thought came back before he mentioned Trinidad and Carnival. There is a, a, a train of thought that... Uh, these individuals or people that engage in this kind of uh, negative activity, they don't feel a sense of ownership in their own country. It doesn't belong to me, so mash it the heck up. Is that a truism? I certainly think that's part of it, absolutely. <coughs> there isn't a sense of ownership. Um, and even if there was, um, it doesn't feel like it's solid ownership. In other words, you know, these things may belong to me, but not, not really, because they haven't been able to make it their own. Someone may have tried to make it their own in, in terms of someone saying, this belongs to you. It's like what happened when I um, heard about the, um, in, when Cedar Bridge was first built, and um, this was, you know, 12, 15 years ago now, um, the um, headmaster at the time told me about three months after it was built, that every day after 3.30 um, p.m., he would have to go around the school and pick up trash from the school. Because the students, even though they were there, it was this new, beautiful new building, and it was the ownership. But it wasn't true ownership. And I, and I thought when he was saying that, that, you know, I wondered whether or not they actually took the time before they were done, before the students came in, to, to get the students to think about, this is yours. How do you want to make it yours? And so when individuals say that, that, that young men are not taking ownership, no, because they haven't been given the opportunity to a certain degree to, to, to be owners of, of their own destiny, for instance. If you grow up without your father or your mother, uh, where do you have the ability to, to have ownership for your life if others are, are, are having to get in your life and, and, and help you to grow up? I mean, it's, it's a very difficult situation, and I, I, I think that we can't just go to 
what individuals are not doing. At this point, if we want to save those individuals and save ourselves, we have to start changing ourselves. You asked earlier, how do we, how do we change this? And this change starts with me. Uh, for instance, if we have 64,000 people on this island, and every individual on this island picked one of these qualities to think of doing every day, compassionate, respectful, authentic, positive, integritous, um, forgiving, if we picked just one quality, we would all automatically start to think about the things that we need to do. We think about our parliamentarians and how they interact with each other. We think about teachers who come to school frustrated and how they interact with the children. There are lots of things that we all of us do every day that suggests that we're really not thinking about change within our own hearts. Mm -hmm. And so if we can consider how we would interact differently, just one thing that we each would do, say do it for a month, I guarantee you we'll come up with the solution for these young people who are feeling so disenfranchised and, and uncared for because all of a sudden you have many, many compassionate people or forgiving people and we would start to look at the positive things we can do in the lives of these young people. And as my dad used to say, we'll love them up one side and down the other mm -hmm. and they'll know what, they won't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. They'll put down their guns and say, oh my gosh, so much love. Absolutely. They don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, I think this is the why the change starts with me mm -hmm. is an important campaign for us because I honestly believe it's something that each one of us must do in order to demonstrate to individuals, whether it's these young people or the other young people who are in this community watching adult behavior, that we mean business, as the young other caller said. We mean business. We're going to actually show you that we care. Mm -hmm. Good evening, caller. Go ahead. You're on the air. Yes, good evening. Good evening. <coughs> Thank you for this conversation. Um, I was thinking, and I'm hoping that the powers to be might listen to this too, when we grew up, we went to wherever school, not just in our parish, we took a test when we left primary school to high school, so if you say it's in Georgia, she might be getting Somerset, and we mixed up all around the island. And nowadays, you're from primary school, but preschool, primary school, middle school, you're in one parish, and then you want to them into big high schools. But then you have primary school children saying, I represent this parish or that parish. Why can't we get back to how it used to be and get a mixed all up instead of having to do a few in your district? And then maybe you might change the social behavior, the social thinking of any this is where I come from and that's where I represent the time they get in high school and in now um, don't be shooting each other because they come from some area. That's just a door. Okay. And I think there's a lot of value to that, um, caller. Um, because in one sense, one of the challenges that faces us today as parents is this technology and the world has become smaller in a sense. Everything's at our fingertips, you know, on the keyboard or on the, on the phone. And in another, it actually helps to expand our worldview. So um, as you talked about, exposing us to different perspectives and points of view um, beyond the walls of your home or your neighborhood or Bermuda is really important to just show us what opportunities there are out there and also show us that just because I may look like you doesn't mean that I'm any more similar to you than the person next to me who I don't look as much alike. You know, that the world is full, we're, we are, there are more similarities actually between groups of people than even within a group of people because we're all unique. We come to this world with our strengths, our gifts, and our challenges. And so how do we get to know that in each other show each other that we do love each other, we do care about each other, um, so that the healing can then begin. This, this, this all sounds so esoteric and, and, and sure organic and, you know, <laughs> yes. how do we make it a reality? That, I think that, that is the biting question. How do we make it a reality? How do we get people to buy into this? Because it's, it's needed. Well, I, I, I also <coughs> want to mention that, yes, we're, we're talking very esoteric, but um, with the right to feel valued, comes the responsibility of, of that value. So this is not about a free pass for anyone. Yes. There, there's responsibility that everyone has to take, including those who are um, acting out in our community. They, they, they have to take responsibility for their actions. Um, and frankly, many of them know that it's wrong, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But they've gotten to a point where they've cho chosen to act out in this way, even though they know it's wrong, because the pain inside them is so strong that um, I was talking with someone the other day where he said, you either commit the crime or you, or, you, or you die. Those were his choices. 
because he didn't feel there was any other option. And so I think we must give them other options, but with those options come responsibility. So that is unadulterated desperation. It is mm -hmm. clearly um, desperate. We never know mm -hmm. the, the, the um, length uh, at which someone is feeling deep pain and hurt from some trauma that they've never recovered from. Mm -hmm. And so we can't, we, we can't really question it. So uh, how do we make it a reality? We, we have to start again not only with each other, but we have to start making sure that whether it's, it's changing behavior. It's changing, it's changing behavior. behavior. Exactly. And it's not so touchy-feely that it's not possible or we wouldn't mm -hmm. be in business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good evening. So, Go ahead. So Family Center, ha you know, and, and other agencies, and we haven't existed for this long if there weren't successes. And so what we're talking about is real. And when families do feel listened to and they feel safe in our space, then the possibilities are endless for them. Good evening, Carla. Go ahead, you're on there. Yes, good evening. Um, a desperate man resorts to desperate measures. Um, I feel that these young men need, these young men cannot meet their basic needs of food, shelter, and clothing. And they are desperate. And, you know, um, a, a hungry, desperate man doesn't need a summon. He's not going to attend any seminars. He's just going to hang around those folk who are in his same chain. And <coughs> I feel that we missed the opportunity of even getting a hold of some of these young men when we had to clean up for the storm. They feel totally neglected, and, and they don't believe any of us, what we had to say. They could have picked up branches. We didn't have to pick and bring anybody in to pick up branches. This government could have paid these young men a minimum wage to come up and pick up branches. Then they will hear you. They, they, they will hear you. They don't need a summon. They need the needs met, and I really feel we, we are missing the point. They need their basic needs met. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. What about that perspective? That is, the, mm. that is a very good perspective. Yes, Thank you, Paula, because, um, you know, we've, we've gone a number of years with the education system hobbling along, the public education system. It, it, it needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. It needs to be I've been hearing that for the past 14 Absolutely. years that I've been here. And, and, and why has it not? It's, it's a level exactly. of accountability. Mm -hmm. It's, okay. it's a level of accountability. So in all these spaces, and this is what the caller is talking about, in all these spaces, you know, deal with the high cost of living, deal with how businesses treat mm -hmm. employee, employees, mm -hmm. deal with the, the education system. And when I say deal with it, make sure that people are, are in the position that can make a difference and we're holding individuals accountable in a, in a okay, kind have, way. We have one minute left, uh, uh, Martha. Just give people the information, how they can get in contact with the, the center and how they can get the assistance that they need. Well, I think one of the most <coughs> the things we'd like to do is, is to just get the country on board with Change Starts With Us and Change Starts With Me. And therefore, uh, quite honestly, go to our Facebook page, um, log your, your commitment to, to, to start Change With You, and then we'll find a way with all the individuals who respond to, to begin to knit this, this community together in the interest of not only these young people, but in, in the interest of children. Okay, thank you for being with us tonight. And of course, parenting in the 21st century, what are Bermuda's challenges and successes? And to assist with that effort, you need to let the change start with you. Visit the Family Center Facebook page and get involved. Thank you for being with us tonight. God bless and enjoy the rest of your evening. Let's Talk is a production of ZBM News 9.